The Plan Air Easton podcast is brought to you by the Avalon Foundation, enriching the lives of those on the eastern shore of Maryland through the arts. Visit avalonfoundation.org for details on events, performances, and educational programming offered throughout the year. Today's episode is sponsored by JFM Enterprises, providing distinctive ready-made and custom frames and moldings to the trade since 1974. Visit jfm.net to view their catalog of designs. Yeah, Jeff, we can edit anything out of this. So if there's something that we actually talk about and then you think afterwards, hey, don't don't put that in, um, you, we, can, we can cut it out for you for sure. Yeah. Um, but it's... <laughs> It shouldn't be that kind of uh, interview, hopefully. I mean, I don't know what Marie knows about you exactly, but uh, maybe it could get that way. Who knows? Right. Yeah, and I, I saw that you're an artist as well, but I haven't seen your work, so I'd love to see that sometime. <laughs> Aw, thank you. Maybe yeah, we Marie. can talk about that too, Tim. I don't know, but... Yeah, yeah, I would love that. I can talk... Any acting thing you got, I would love to talk to you about that. Yes. <laughs> we were talking about, you know... Keeping it interesting and keeping... We're going to do biographical stuff, of course, but then getting into, like, what makes you tick and that kind of stuff. All right. Yeah. Well, I'm a boring guy. (laughs) 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 All right. Welcome, everybody, to the Plein Air Easton Podcast. Marie, we are here again. We're interviewing Jeff Williams today. Jeff Williams, our watercolorist, uh, third place winner in 2021... And architects, anybody out there who is looking to like look for a life post architecture, he has had a lot of success in the last couple of years since he's retired. It's a really interesting story, and some fast success too. It's um, you have to give a listen to um, just understand what uh, what motivated him to jump on in. And the other thing that really comes across too is that but that sort of Oklahoma um, kindness and sort of lifestyle that. Um, he sort of brings him, even when he just says any sort of regular old sentence, he's just kind of a good old Oklahoma boy. <laughs> Let's take a listen to Jeff. Thanks for listening, everyone. Marie, how you been? We're excited about today's guest, Jeff Williams. How have you been before we get into Jeff? How's it going? I'm great. I'm great. I'm, you know, loving the little bit of a change and the crisp weather. Are you watching the football season, Marie? Are yeah, you into football? I'm sorry. I'm not a football watcher. Not at it's all. It's just not my How not about the my hubby? Jam. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's on all day. If it's not <laughs> football, then it's soccer all day. Jeff, how's Oklahoma's football doing down there? How is Oklahoma football? Well, doing? we're doing pretty good. Uh, everybody thinks of University of Oklahoma when they hear football around here, but uh, or when they, they think of Oklahoma because they're always ranked high. They're doing pretty well. But Oklahoma State, where I'm from, is is doing quite well as well. So we're maybe we'll break into the top ten this week. We'll see. So. Very good, very good. Everyone, we are with Jeff Williams, uh, plein air Easton artist, and uh, I guess it was his first year last year. Marie, you want to uh, go ahead and uh, talk about Jeff a little bit, and Jeff, uh, chime in on on how you got here and that, that type of thing? Uh, yep, so it was your first year, plein air Easton, this year. Let me ask, um, so a burning question is, how many times did you enter? <laughs> well... First off, thanks for having me on this. This is delightful. I'm, I'm really pleased to be doing this with you. Um, it was my second time applying. Uh, uh, when I didn't get in the first time, I, it sure set a goal for me the, the second time. And when I did get in in 2020, I was uh, quite disappointed then to have to turn it down um, because of COVID. So I was thrilled to be there this year. So appreciate you continuing that invitation. So. What, uh, what 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 do you mean, uh, Jeff? When you say uh, you talk about getting into did not getting in the first time versus the second time, uh, what 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 did you do? Oh, I, I I think I just developed a little bit more. Maybe it's a different judge. I, I, I'm not quite sure to be honest, but uh, I sure was excited. I you know but when you said you set a goal for yourself, you know. Uh, how did that how did that process sort of come out well with, with applications like that I, I don't know that you in, in terms of goal setting you, you, you hope 
Um, you never know when you apply to plein air events whether you'll be accepted or not. You know, it's dependent on the judge and, and what they think of what you've sent in. Um, I probably tweaked what I sent a little bit. Um, uh, I had more to send the second time because I'd been on the circuit then for uh, a year. So, um, that you know, that, I'm sure those things had some impact on it. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, each year I try and think uh, back over what I've been doing that year and, and, you know, what do I want to try and accomplish this coming year? And, and uh, I mean, I've always thought about goal setting. I, I don't know that I'm very good at really attacking each goal specifically and going after it, but it gives me something to make steps toward anyway. And, and so uh, the two events that I had applied to in 2019 that I didn't get into were Texas and, and uh, um, uh, Easton. And, and I thought of those as some of the top events in the country. And so, you know, I wanted to keep pursuing that. So. Did you end up getting into Texas? Because I know there's a lot of... Uh, yeah, uh, I did. I did. And, uh, you know, that's closer to home for me. And so it was within a day's drive. And they bent over backwards last fall to uh, try and make it uh, safe for the artists and for the participants um, uh, that the, the came. And, and sales were great. I had a fabulous event. I was quite impressed. And so that made me feel better coming into the events this year. Um, well, I know. I know. Texas boys don't like those Okies very, very. Often. They don't let them into you know, everything. <laughs> in Texas. Oh, is that true? You know, <laughs> everybody talks about Texans, and and uh, uh, I know they love where they're from, and that's good. We all should. They've been very gracious. I, I love going down to Texas. In fact, uh, um, each year uh, um, we can talk this about this a little bit later too. But there's a a group of us that go down to Big Bend every February and, and uh, uh, paint down along the Mexico border. And, and it's such a different environment to me that it's, it's a fascinating place to go to as well. So I like going no, down I was, to Texas. I got a few guys I, I there. So. I lived in Texas for a little bit. I just, I didn't, I was being from Maryland. I didn't know, uh, you know, the whole, I mean, I obviously learned a lot about the state when I was there and, the 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 uh, the rivalry between Oklahoma and Texas always seemed kind of tongue in cheek and charming to me. It was, it was kind of a kind of a joke. I'm sure there's some, you know. Um, anyway, uh, Marie, what about uh, or Jeff? You uh, you came from architecture. I I did. Um, I uh, uh, you know my my grandfather was an architect. I grew up in New Jersey, and and he was an architect in New York City, and so. Anytime I was interested in something sort of artistic as a child, everybody just said, oh, well, you know, you're going to be an architect. And that's kind of what I what I believed or what I thought and naturally pursued. And and I loved it. I I, I had an incredible amount of success there. And, and uh, um, I, uh, I, I I've been quite blessed all the way through my life, I think. But uh Certainly, um, uh, when we had the chance to move to Oklahoma, that was a blessing. It was a type of lifestyle and, and a place that I had never knew about or thought was possible. Um, it brought me to Oklahoma State University, where I went to undergraduate and graduate school and, and uh, um, met an incredible group of faculty that were building at the time, later became colleagues of mine when I came back to teach. But uh, um, they... they pushed me into design competitions and architecture, which were national and international competitions. I won the top uh, architectural design competition when I was in graduate school, which uh, funded my way to travel in Europe for a year. Um, and so my wife and I sold our house and our cars and all our furniture, everything we had and bought a little camper and traveled all over Europe that way. And that was really when I used my time to draw uh, or learn to draw. Um, I brought a couple books with me. You know, in architecture, you're expected to draw and present things, and but but you, uh, at least where I was, you were just expected to pick that up as you're working on design projects. And I always loved the the presentation process. Um, introduced the watercolor through architecture because it was a traditional painting medium. 
So, you know, I did that. I practiced for a while full time and then was recruited to teach. And teaching allowed me to keep going back to Europe and taking students back to Europe in the summers and, and helping them learn to draw. And, and so, I mean, I never thought I would change that or retire or anything. I thought I'd just keep practicing and teaching. But like that is uh, like, that that's that's what got me right there, um, Jeff. Is I want to know more about these uh, trips, these traveling trips with the students and the and the sketching trips and the um, bumping around from city to city. <laughs> Can you say a little bit more about that? Well, you know, when I did that after graduate school, I fell in love with sort of living that way and traveling that way. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I became fairly proficient at drawing. And, and uh, so I, I really enjoyed sharing that with the students and helping encourage them. We had a summer program, not a year long program at our school. And so we would, uh, for 30 years, it was based out of Versailles. So I'd go over and basically live in Versailles for the summer and we'd travel out of there. Um, Bummer. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we later moved that to uh, to Rome, so then I had you know several years doing that out of Rome. Um, but both were great. They were different, but but terrific. Um, but uh, um, <clears throat> I don't know. I considered that one of the great perks of of teaching. So, uh, but I, I just I enjoyed teaching. I love design um, and. Uh, I enjoyed helping the students with their presentations, and uh, I probably did more teaching of presentations to them than I ever had. But and you were painting buildings. You were painting buildings at this time, or, draw, or doing design on buildings. Was, Is that correct? Yeah, I was sketching when we were in Europe. We were sketching buildings and urban scenes, mostly in pencil, some in ink. I really never painted before, although in architectural presentations, I. I used uh, acrylic, uh, we airbrushed, we did a lot of ink line work, uh, um, you know, uh, there was a lot of composition involved, and, and then in the design studios, which was where my focus was, um, we would teach students to design buildings, and I, I, I've always, I, I think, uh, uh, enjoyed problem solving and complexity in, in my mind. And, and so I, I, in practice and in teaching, I kind of gravitated toward larger and more complex uh, problems. Um, you know, when I was practicing, I did projects for the Mayo Clinic, uh, so a couple of projects. Um, I, I worked on master plans. I did large university projects. Um, and so I continued to do that sort of thing, although I taught at all levels in the design studio. I think what that gave me was, uh, uh, you know, a good solid grounding in, in design, in composition, in understanding values, in drawing and understanding perspective. And so I had all those things, but I'd never really painted. And always, probably in the early 90s, I started really wanting to to learn to watercolor paint or at least experiment with that but uh it, I, I really didn't have time to do that at that point and you know i was i was teaching full-time i had a practice on the side so i was practicing uh in the evenings we were raising a family and so i'd worked late into the night uh but uh, i started getting books and just in you know if I had time to watch television or was sitting with the kids and they were engaged, I, I would look at a, 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 a watercolor or painting book um, or magazines and, and got some videos. And I just did that for about 30 years. But I, uh, when the Internet came along, I started searching during lunch hours while I was eating to, to, to find images and examples. And so I had a pretty good visual vocabulary and a a sense of things as I came time to learn to paint, but I had hadn't really had any brush time. So, Jeff, right. what um, of those people you said that you reviewed books and videos and such like? Who were the big influencers in that time? Like, what what books were you thumbing through? And like, were you watching Bob Ross or what are we watching here? <laughs> no, no, I never really watched Bob Ross, although I know everybody jokes about it. But uh, uh, I, uh, 
I, I was and am totally enamored with Joseph Zabukovic. He's become a friend. I took a couple workshops with him and have painted with him elsewhere. Um, he, he's just incredible with atmosphere and mood in a painting. And, and I learned a process from him. Um, uh, it was like watching magic to watch him paint. I really admire the work of Trevor Chamberlain from Britain. Um, uh, who also has an architectural rendering background, um, uh, but uh, uh, very inspirational paintings. He's had, uh, I think, a lot of influence on Andy Evenson, who's another uh, painter from the U.S. that I really ad admire. Um, so there's people like that. Uh, I, I certainly look back at, at, you know, Homer and Sargent and Wyeth and, uh, um, you know, people of that era or or that type of thing so to paint up at cape ann where some of those guys painted was just an incredible uh opportunity i thought and and a wonderful place to paint um uh, you know I'm, I'm kind of blank here Seago. uh what painting did jeff win with this what was his painting this year that he won with he won what did he win and um, so Jeff was the third place winner, um, and that includes an automatic invitation for next year too. But so. what did he paint? What did he paint? What did he paint? A beautiful Oxford morning. An Oxford morning. Painted. So, uh, did anything that you did leading up to, you know, through Rome and through Versailles, and is anything any of that information in that Oxford morning painting? Oh, sure. Sure. Of course. You know, when, when people ask you, you know, how long did it take you to do that painting? The standard answer is two hours plus, uh, uh 40 years or what, you know, whatever, however long. Did it <laughs> right. Take. Right. Um, so, you know, I, I, I would kind of answer it that way, but, uh, um, certainly, you know, having learned and experimented with a process, uh, uh, a sequencing of putting watercolor down. Watercolor is a little different than than oil um, in that you you really have to think through the painting and have a a fairly clear sense of where you want to go, um, uh, what you're trying to achieve, and you have to preserve whites that will be in the painting. So so that was a big part of this particular painting was preserving the light. It was really a painting about the morning light the sunlight coming up and there were clouds a, a storm had moved through early and so there were distant clouds in between the sun and where i was sitting along the water and so there were light reflections there were color light reflections the there were the clouds which were stormier and moody and so it was a combination of things uh, but but certainly to answer your question there were a lot of things from the background uh experience that, that came through uh there was drawing skills uh you know as you're painting you're looking at values and and trying to work uh, uh the balance the overall balance of the painting out um you know, my painting i guess i was asked on a more sort of romantic level like oh that blue reminds me of <laughs> the blue when i was in rome or you, ah, you know ah. or any anything uh, you know and that, it's not even a very good question, but um, just with that much of your life loving to do that, and 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 you, you know, uh, you, as you said, you know, I look, I love living my life traveling in in those months or whatever. Is there anything in the architecture over there at all that reminds you of any architecture in America? Uh. What I loved about it was that it was so different from America. Uh, there, there's more and more influence on, on America, but there's such a, a historic base there. And really, when I go back to the East Coast, I feel some of that as well. Um, uh, you know, I, I was in Annapolis a few weeks before Easton, and, and uh, you know, the history and the character of a community like that or a town like that or a town like uh, Alexandria near you guys uh, those those types of places are fascinating to me, um, and and uh, they have a little more of a European character, um, although the the history in Europe is longer, and the buildings that populate those places are older and you know different architectural styles in a lot of cases. Um, yeah, uh, I agree with that too. Like a lot of the a lot of the uh, historic East Coast 
towns and Tidewater, Virginia and everything. Just a little a little twinge of European yeah. um, flavor to them. But, yeah. but we, we just, these people, I mean, when you talk about the, the age of the buildings, you know, and you look at the ornateness of the buildings... Um, they had years and years and years and years to build these things, correct? Sure, yeah. Uh, and, and and it's a community that's evolved over hundreds of years, not just a hundred years, like in Oklahoma. You know, We have nice historic buildings, but they're from the late 1800s, early 1900s in Oklahoma. It's older than right. that on the East Coast. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the other things that I... Um, uh, taught when I was uh, uh, at the university was uh, uh, the history of urban form and and uh, I would uh, sometimes put planning projects or uh, urban design projects in the studio the upper level studios um, and so we would talk about how a city develops or a community um, uh, uh, occurs and why a town starts where it does and and um, and I was kind of going towards more Jeff towards like how much different that would be than painting a barn, you know, <laughs> that's kind of where I was kind of like, sort of like, yeah, you know, one of the interesting things, yeah, I think I understand what you're getting at. And, and I actually paint a lot of barns because, you know, they come naturally to me having done the architecture. Um, right. But, uh, uh, and, and I like the age, the, 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 the fact that most of these barns are, um, have a history, um, like the towns that I would paint, uh, or sketch rather in, in Europe. Uh, okay. and, uh, so, so I did like that, but, uh, uh, as, while I find buildings and towns natural to, to paint or comfortable to paint, let me put it that way. What I've really, really enjoyed are doing landscapes which is something I hadn't done very much before. And uh, I just absolutely love being out in the landscape and trying to communicate these organic forms and light conditions and various types of landscapes that I encounter on the plein air circuit. Um, uh, uh, those are great challenges. And in many ways, the painting that you were asking about is more about the landscape than any architectural components. So there, there was perspective, there were a lot of docks and some boats and things in the view as well, but really not any buildings to speak of. So, yeah, that it, that's that's clear when I was um, reviewing like your online catalog and everything about how you know, despite being um, architecturally trained, that you really gravitate towards the landscape aspect of it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, I've always loved being outdoors, and as much as I thought I'm going into architecture, I did toy with the idea of going into forestry or landscape architecture because I used to love to hike and fish and uh, backpack and you know do those things too. So this is yeah, the way. Yeah, now to you can connect, do them all. Yeah, connect back to some of that, right? Put your easel in your backpack and go to some little remote location. Take your bear spray. <laughs> all <laughs> right, Jeff. Can we? Let's um, tell us a little bit about how you um, how you segued from your career to plein air art, and how 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 did you like? Did you always know about the circuit, or how did you stumble upon that? Yeah, good question. I, I have I have had no knowledge of the circuit. I really didn't know anything. I I, I retired from architecture for some personal reasons. Um, uh, really with the intention of traveling with my wife, trying to uh, uh, travel in a way similar to what we did in Europe. And so we bought a small motor home. Um, we traveled for a while. We had redone a house here in Oklahoma that we came back to. Uh, and I wanted to learn watercolor. And so I was painting um, uh, just for myself, just trying to learn the medium, uh, experimenting a lot. Uh, and I, I did one of the, uh, uh, what's the, um, the Strata challenge, the Strata easels, uh, yes. has a, a monthly challenge twice a year to do a painting for 30 days in a row and post it online. Well, I was a little intimidated about posting, but I thought this is going to be a good way to learn. So I, I signed up for that and posted and, um, 
gosh, I was kind of surprised at people's reactions and people started asking to buy the paintings and, and I didn't win the easel, but I, I won a lot of other things through the process. And, you know, I developed a website then because of that. Uh, but I still was pretty novice and, and I did that a couple of times, but, uh, and I had taken a couple of workshops and, and some from Joseph, some from Tom, one from Tom Schaller, one from, uh, uh, Tony Van Hasselt, uh, up in Maine, uh, an old time watercolor painter. Um, and, and so I had some things to build on in, in one of the, uh, Joseph's Boothwick workshops. I met and became friends with uh, Dick Sneary, Richard Sneary, who's been yep. east in quite a number of times. And he's kind of become a mentor for me in, in uh, the, the painting world, especially. He comes from the architecture side as well. He was one of the top architectural renderers in the country before he uh, transitioned to fine art. And uh, he was very encouraging, and he kept telling me about the plein air world. Uh, in fact, he's the one that started the Big Bend trip and and invited me to be part of that. And and he stayed. In fact, he's going to stay here tomorrow night. We're all on our way. Oh, down nice! To, yeah, tell him we said Major hey. Will be here. Yeah, we've got a couple guys staying here before we head down to Plain Air, Texas this year uh, on, on Wednesday. So uh, Matt Barber Kennedy's coming through and staying with my wife Friday night. <laughs> so. Uh, nice. I, I love the community that's happened, but it all happened, you know, initially because of that connection with Dick. And he eventually started pushing these these uh, plein air competitions. And I said, you know, I, I have no interest in that. I don't think that's for me. You know, I, I, I did so much competition throughout my <laughs> Little did you know he was luring you to the dark side. I know. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> He invited me down to in Plain Air, Texas. I think in the fall of 2017, and uh, said, "Just come see what it looks like." And I said, "You know, I, I, I don't know." But we finally agreed, and we took our RV down for the week, and just kind of hung out with the artists. And I kept asking them, "Why do you do this?" Uh, you know, uh, and and they they always said, "Because of the other artists." You know, this is my peer group. This is my social time with people that understand me. Um, you know, I can paint in my studio or out in the field on my own and uh, uh, just be totally isolated my entire life if I choose to. But this is my time when I can come together with everybody else. And I like the sound of that. And they were incredibly collegial. Um, and I found that to be uh, true all the way through my experience with the plein air. Um, and the other thing that really sold me on it are two things. One is there was competition, but it, it was more competition with themselves than with uh, other people. They weren't trying to beat somebody as much as they were trying to do the best work that they can. And uh, the, the successes seemed to get spread around uh, from event to event, uh, judge to judge. Um, uh, better painting to better painting, you know. Sometimes you don't do your best painting, sometimes you do, and, and hopefully that gets rewarded. But uh, the, the competition side of it wasn't as intense between people as I thought it was going to be, and I liked that. Um, I love the competition with myself. And then the other thing that just gets me pumped up every time I do this is when the show goes up. And, you know, if you've had 30 or 40 painters at a place, or in your case, 58, you know, and, you know, maybe they do 10 paintings, maybe they do 15 paintings, whatever. Think about how many paintings those are that, that creates, you know, hundreds of paintings that all come all at the same time from incredibly talented artists, some of the best people around the country. And it was all done right there, looking at often the same subjects, so many different ways. And there's so much learning that goes on there that that just really, really excites me still, every time. Yes, we know each of those paintings, but remember, because we catalog them all. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> well, you guys and get we to see the best of the best every time. I'm, I'm, 
Yeah. I'm really excited for you. <laughs> and you know, the the one piece that makes me sad, though, are the ones that we don't get to see. You know, the ones that are sold off the easel or, yeah. you know, don't make it to the competition or, you know, are, uh, um, you know, come into the inventory that is not in the competition gallery. Right. You know, sometimes you don't get to see all those and, and there's some real gems in there. Yeah. The very first plein air Easton that we did um, as part of the Avalon Foundation, Al Bond, the executive director, actually brought up how solitary of a life being a painter can be because um, right. you are out there by yourself. And that was another re that was one reason to do the festival. The other part was to, you know, bring all of this, uh, all these paints together in a, in, a, in a big show. And and that's kind of the other part that you just mentioned there. I will say, if you have not seen this, another beautiful day in Oxford morning. Uh, that he uh, won with third place for the for the um, Planner East in 2021 last year. It is a gorgeous painting. It's the first painting on his site here. And um, maybe go check that out because it is a wonderful, wonderful watercolor. Is that painting sell, Jeff? It better yeah, sell. it, it sold painting... before the awards. And, yeah. In fact, yeah. a <laughs> funny story, when I was, I, I, I was stunned to have been selected third place and, and you know, incredibly honored, uh, especially from Mr. Weiss. But uh, um, I, because of that, I didn't remember too much of what was happening at the time, but I was coming <laughs> down off of the stage and trying to work my way back through the crowd, and this guy leans over and says, I'm the proud new owner of that painting. And I was, <laughs> and all of a sudden I wanted to meet him and find out about him and take pictures and all of that and everything else is going on and... and it was a funny time, but yeah, it did sell to a gentleman that uh, is, uh, I think, from Virginia. So, great, 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 Marie. I think we want to find out what makes Jeff tick. We always the first segment is always about like, okay, who you are, what's your history, how'd you get into it. We know that his parents told him he was going to be an architect, so he had no choice in his life but to become an architect, and he did that with. <laughs> is that kind of it in a nutshell? He Jeff? did, he he did that with great aplomb. <laughs> and, and and totally loved it because he got to tour Europe being an architect with teaching kids and that kind of thing. Um, but you're new at this, Jeff, right? Yeah, so you're yeah, newbie yeah. here. Pretty new. Um, yeah, well, so this a, is only your th your third year, is that is that true? Yes. You said 2018. One, one of those was COVID year. So mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, we I don't painted count that through year, 2018 no. kind of on my own, and uh, Dick kept pushing these plein air events. So I thought, well, I'll. I'll apply to some and just see if I can get in one. So I just blanket made applications based on everything that was advertised in the um, plein air magazine and um, uh, focused on things east of the Rockies because I had family back east still and uh, thought that would be a, a good way to, to get to see family. If I got in something, and and lo and behold, I got in twelve of fourteen that I'd applied to, which you know I was stunned again, and and uh, you know I hadn't planned any of that, so some of them overlapped. I had to turn a few down, but I I did probably eight, I don't know nine, something like that, and I was going back and forth across the country because there was no plan to how I was going to do this, um, so I. I think I traveled about 25,000 miles that summer and, and 25,000 wow. miles. Yeah, yeah. It was a lot of driving. Did and, you, end, and, did uh, you end up making a plan? Did you get, did you get a, I mean, the next year I applied you, with more thought, <laughs> but, uh, meaning it was what, a great meaning what experience, you know, I, any plein air experience is a, a, a valuable learning experience. It's different than painting in the studio. You're confronted with everything out there and have to, figure out, you know, what your focus is going to be, what a painting's about, how to compose it, uh, um, and, and, you know, what makes helps you make that choice. There could be a lot of things that are talked about in that process. But um, then in addition, each event is in a different part of the country, and I was so new, every time I went, I was painting things I'd never painted before. I was in places I hadn't been and experiencing those. The weather varies, uh, the, you know, there were just constant things that impact the, the painting that you're doing. And, and I just found all of that really stimulating and really interesting. And, and 
um, the, the, they began to take me to, you know, I had opportunities to paint in the bayous and to paint water and to paint boats and, or shrimp boats and then to paint, you know, recreational boats on the East Coast and do water scenes. I hadn't done a lot of water before and to do mountain scenes and I had never done mountains before and waterfalls up at the Canadian border and hadn't done those before and, uh, the Gloucester coast and painting the surf and the sea, I'd never done that, you know, and, and, you know, each time, uh, there, there were so many different things that were new experiences. It just created an incredible way to, to, to learn and to grow rapidly. And, you know, I just started looking at, well, it, I don't know if I can do this or not, but I'm going to just think about each painting as an experiment as an experience to learn from and and hopefully i'll be able to make something nice out of it and i've been able to pretty consistently do that you know there have been a few that i haven't turned in but uh, uh not too many and i think as going through that process my skill level built so when you ask about what did i do differently in strategizing or applying to east and i think i had some better things to to, to uh enter with for sure um you know, I won some awards in the process and, and sold paintings, and those were great. Yeah. Um, so I have a question because doing 12 events out of 14 events in your first year and knowing all the things that you or some of the things that you have to cart around with you and, you know, you're in a different location, like you said, like, it sounds exhausting. Like, what did you do to, um, you know, like, refill your cup and and nourish yourself after all that or keep your head straight i mean well, that's a that's a good observation I, I i did feel some of that um uh uh i didn't know i was gonna feel that either i love to travel i love to be on the road so i looked forward to that part of it um uh but it it's it's very tiring as you say and and it's mentally exhausting as much as physically exhausting uh, we sold our RVs uh, because in the plein air activities, you know, housing is provided, or at least the ones I was applying to, that was always a, a need. And so I got a little minivan. Um, I thought my minivan days were over when the kids grew up, but uh, uh, <laughs> they come in handy. <laughs> I, I carry a bed in it. I store things. I've got a r rack on the roof that I carry things in. But, you know, there's always stuff that comes up. Um, when I was coming to East End, I, I was on, that was the end of an eight week road trip for me without my wife. I was really pretty homesick at that point when I got there, but I was bumped about East End. And uh, um, I had done Annapolis and Mountain Maryland earlier in June and then saw some family and went up uh, to do a commission in Connecticut and, uh, you know, kind of killed time in between the events. And I had taken all of my frames, JF Evan frames, by the way, uh, and, <laughs> and put them on the, in the roof rack in the container and, uh, you know, kind of left them there for a couple of weeks. And, and I started thinking as I was heading to East, and, oh, gosh, you know, it's been really hot, and that container is black, and uh, I hope those frames are okay. I'm really worried about them. And I get down to my host in Easton, and I'm unpacking, and, anxiously you know uh, opening up things to, to get to the frames and the entire container had about three or four inches of water in it all my <sighs> frames had been soaking in water for a couple of weeks no. and i didn't know it and I, <sighs> oh you know i freaked out i thought here goes 1500 or a couple thousand dollars worth of frames maybe you know and, and i'm trying to spread them all out and dry them and um, thinking, well, I, I, I go see what Pat has it, you know, when he gets here. And well, I got him. I, I only lost one frame, and I, I, I thought this Good was frame. incredible. I went back to JFM and Waterproof. sang his praises so much. <laughs> but when I got exactly. there, somebody already told him the story. When I told him my name, he said, "You had water problems." <laughs> oh Pat, we love Pat. But anyway, sorry, Jeff. Do you think do you think that uh, you should have been painting your whole? I mean, I'm just asking because you got into twelve or fourteen and you're starting to sell. And um, do you think you should have been painting your whole life? You know, I, I the question's gone through my mind. I, I not not because I think oh I'm good at it, but because I enjoy it so much and it it brings me pleasure and and 
I've thought at times if I'd known this was available, I might have done it 10 or 15 years before. Or, but, you know, that, that's just life. And I loved what sure, I was yeah, doing. No, yeah. And, and um, you know, I, I, uh, I, I don't look back. I just try and keep looking forward. And I'm, I'm excited about the time I have left. I started painting because I thought this is something that will challenge me intellectually till I die. And I can keep doing it you know, uh, as long as I physically can. And, and this is just an extra bonus to, to painting, you know, is to be part of doing this now. I didn't realize that I needed the sort of intense stimulation that the events has brought me. I, I love, one of the things I love about doing paintings is I will get totally engrossed in it and everything else goes away, you know. I just have to concentrate that much and think about what I'm doing. And, and so if I have a lot of interruptions or uh, whatever, sometimes that, that doesn't settle as well. Although I love visiting with people like, like I am with you guys now. So I love visiting with the, um, uh, you know, the patrons uh, if they come up. But uh, at the same time, I, I, it, it does affect my concentration. So I often try and find more remote places to paint. One of the reasons I love doing the landscapes. But, um, you know. Well, so another thing that we had talked about, too, in over the years is that um, painting had become sort of like the new golf for a lot of people that didn't <laughs> want to take up golf because, well, it, it, it's kind of funny. You've been talking actually, to Eric Rhodes. Whole... <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Well, uh, he actually it, got that from us, but <laughs> no. we'll believe that. Well, there you go. Anyway, well, no, the reason is because of the competing with yourself. Yeah. I mean, golf is the same sort of thing. I mean, you try to, you want to win, but you're really playing against yourself. And it, that's what, sound, with the painting, you're you're always challenging yourself, you know, and that's right. the same kind of game golf is, and that's kind of how we went to that. Um, Interesting. Well, I that, didn't know that. When he... When he said that, that kind of reminded me of like what um, a, a long distance runner or a marathon runner will say is, you know, they get to the point where they're in the zone and, you know, it's that it's it's that painting zone, you know, like a, like an athlete gets. Yeah, into. especially with the concentration you just mentioned where you block right. everything else right. out. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and I, I guess maybe that goes away with, you know, if you've been doing it for 20 years, you're able to block, excuse me, block things out easier. But um, it certainly seems like, because it is part of the festival. I mean, we do right. hear artists say that, that like, hey, the people coming in, you know, uh, but you have to do that in, 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 in these plein air festivals, yeah. for sure. To some degree. Have you, ever, right? yeah. have you ever had anybody mess up one of your paintings, Jeff? <laughs> no, no, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big guy. They wouldn't dare. No. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, okay. Now, you know, one thing that I thought of, though, while we were talking about that, that I wanted to say while we're on the air is that I was so impressed with Easton, in, especially in the fact that here you guys are, the top event in the country. You know, you've been doing it for a long time. Everybody looks at what you're doing to uh, model theirs after. And yet, six months before the event you guys are emailing the artists to ask for ideas and things to do new you know you could have just been doing the same things you're doing and i know you were coming out of covid and trying to reprocess things that you learned in covid and stuff but uh then it also seemed like you listened to a lot of the things that had been shared and you made changes to the way you did things this year and to me that was that was incredible you know to have the top already wanting to keep getting better and that's how i think many of us try and think about our painting too so that was really appreciated thanks well thank you very much yeah, jeff that is you. marie and and uh she is the she runs that event um and has really taken over the event over the last you know i don't know five years marie um where you've really become yours before it was like okay well let's bring somebody in to help with the event and maybe right. she'll eventually do it. So, um, and Marie is excited about it, almost obnoxiously excited about it at times. <laughs> I have to be very, very honest about it. Um, you, you know, you can kind of tell in her right. voice when she's doing these interviews. Uh, and but she does it year round. No I mean, that smile. Uh, no, yeah, well, <laughs> that doesn't hurt. But she does it year round. You know, they do, she does it year round and, 
Yeah, um, we're all we're constantly brainstorming. What's you know we we're not going to get stale. I, yeah. That is a that is a fact. Well, you, we, well yeah, we will I mean, not dial it in. But it does take work. It does take you know it, it, asking the staff and asking the participants, especially when you know we might make a mistake. I mean, uh, we're not above saying we made a mistake, or and we're certainly not above uh, noticing them. I mean that we are painstaking about like what didn't go well and um thankfully over the course of 17 or 18 years we've limited those things so that's how you learn uh, though so yeah and we have a good laugh and yeah. you know <laughs> we're like how can, yeah. how can we do better <laughs> <laughs> yeah but the event has become something uh special for the town i guess uh i don't i'm just curious about like when you come to easton uh jeff and this is I know that there are other places. I know you're going to Olmstead next or something. Are you wanting to surprise somewhere in Olmstead? Is that correct? And then you talked about Cape Ann and Texas. And I know there's a big scene in California. But when you come to Easton, you hear that, like, and it could be any any town in America, but you heard about the big plein air festival. This is the one you want to get into or whatever. What were you expecting was could be any better than or could somehow earn the recognition as the best and what were you expecting and, and did it, you know, uh, sort of like meet your criteria for what you would expect out of the best? And I'm not talking about Easton, just in general, like how does, how does it, I mean, we do plenty, we don't go to a whole lot of plenary festivals. No. We go to conventions and things like that, but I'm sure it's just as charming in Cape Ann. I'm sure it's just as charming in Olmstead. Is it the sales in Easton? Is that what it is specifically or? or? Um, you know, I'm always most concerned with, producing the best paintings I can and to me that's really why I'm doing this and and the sales are good and necessary the uh, I love meeting the variety of people that are there I love experiencing different places um, but when you guys organize an event that's organized for the artists to try and produce their best work that's really really appreciated and I felt like you guys did that um, and, right. and, okay. and that that was the type of thing that you were responding to in answers to those questions that you asked. And right. and that was so appreciated. Um, you know, I've done some events that feel like they're organized for the convenience of the event spot or the event organizers, you know. Um, and, and they're sometimes in that process disruptive to the process of doing painting. Or they, you know, they're organized to try and maximize sales, so they try and put you in contact so much with the patrons that it's disruptive to the painting process. Trying to find a balance of all of those, I think, is necessary because it has to be organized well. It has to be um, uh, uh, to, to raise funds for you and sales uh, uh, for the artists. Uh, um, uh, uh, <laughs> it's a balancing act. Yeah, it, it is. But but I think. You guys, you already have a history of great sales, and you have that patron base built. And yes, you want to put them in touch with the artists, but I didn't feel like that got in the way of producing paintings this time. And sometimes I feel like that when I leave an event. Uh, so it's a tricky thing to achieve a balance like that, I think. And, you know, this is just the artist perspective. I've been really interested to hear some of your interviews like with Susan at, at Cape Ann or when when your team sits down and talks about the process of putting the event together it presents other views besides just this artist's view but uh, there's a lot involved in pulling one of these together and, and I admire what you guys do well congratulations Marie yeah, thank, thank you. you and thank you Jeff for that thank answer you. and like I said I, you know we don't want to talk about Issa I was just like I started hearing these other names you know, because I'm involved, you know, peripherally with the festival and I do this podcast and you start to hear, you know, some festivals go away, but then there's other ones who are who are getting stronger, it seems like. And, and that's Absolutely. good for painting in general, art, the art world in, in right. general. Um, right. So uh, just curious about that, not to toot our own horn. What's your uh, what's on your radar, Jeff, coming up for the for the next year do you already have all of your applications in or? well you know i i have some in um I'm, I'm trying to figure all of that out i've been visiting with my wife and with other painters and and 
uh, you know, I head this week to Texas and do that again. And, and that's one I hope to continue to be able to, to get into because it's a, a convenient one for me and been a, a very successful one down there. Um, uh, you know, I, <clears throat> I don't want to be running around doing 25,000 miles and being on the road eight weeks and all of that. I uh, found that, at least for me, at the point I am in life, that's pretty tiring. Um but rather, I, I'm, I'm going to try and really prioritize what have been the the most successful events for me in terms of sales and uh, uh, prestige and and things that will keep moving me forward. Um, uh, so you know, places like Easton, I want to keep applying to. There's a few others on my list that I want to keep doing. Um, but I'm, I'm getting a little more critical about, you know, will I apply to, to this event or that event uh, and, and balancing it against other things. One thing that I've found when I go to events is that I'm always intrigued to see what what will there be to paint. And, and having a, a good place to paint that challenges me, that's interesting to me, uh, is, is a top priority to me. And uh, uh, so, you know, that's always going to be a draw, um, but uh, um, I, I find that I'll, I'll get immersed, particularly in a new place, I'll get immersed in paint for a week intensely, and by the end of that week, I feel like, oh, I'm getting it. I have a real sense of what this place is like, and now I'm really uh, developing uh, an approach to paint this subject or that type of subject or what the colors are like here, or the atmosphere is like here, or whatever it is. Um, and then I have to leave and go to another one. And I thought it would be really <laughs> nice like the- to have a longer extended period of time to, to take advantage of that investigation. And and so because of that, I've applied to a few residencies this year to for next year to see, you know, if I could get to a place for a month or so and just paint that place and, uh, um, you know, I, I'd have to give up a few plein air events to be able to do things like that. But and and who knows if I'll get them. But but uh, you know, that's one of the things I'm looking toward. Um, I also want to paint larger. When I'm at the plein air events, I I tend to paint uh, things that are more mobile, sizes that are more mobile things that I can do in a certain time frame. And so the largest that I paint in watercolor has been um, uh, what they call quarter sheet, which is 11 by 14 or so. Some guys can pull off a a half sheet painting at a plein air event. Uh, I haven't tried to take that on yet, but I think to do larger things, some of that needs to be in the studio. And so that's why I'm trying to balance time with the, plein air events and studio things in the future or other locations but um those are types of things i'm thinking about so well listen it being three years into it you know we wish you all the best of luck we certainly hope you'll apply back to easton um, along with well, the he other... doesn't have to this year. Oh, you don't have to. That's right. You're, you're, He's uh... an automatic in, yeah. so yeah. he is. You are already on the roster for 2022. Well, and you're That's on my wonderful calendar. to hear as well. <laughs> now we, get to, we know you a little bit better uh, this year. One place I might suggest is like maybe you can convince the, your the, your lovely wife to maybe go over to Versailles or Rome and try to do some plein air painting over there. Maybe something that might. Be well, cool. that is on the on the horizon because. That's her interest. <laughs> There's no yeah, yeah. necessary. <laughs> <laughs> right. Is right. she an artist also? No, she's not. She has a background working with children. But I'll tell you one interesting thing. Um, uh, and, and she she is a very bright, inquisitive person and uh, a great support to me. Uh, so she's come with me at times. Uh, she wasn't with me when I was at Easton this time, but she's in 2019. She traveled several times with me and needed something to do, so she wrote her first novel, and she's working on Whoa. her second now. And and so hopefully she'll get a lot of writing done while I'm at Texas. But uh, my life is my life is just a waste. <laughs> <laughs> my life is a total waste. It's a total waste. It's just unbelievable. Uh, all right, let's do some rapid fire we, questions. We, we, we've been okay for three rapid okay, fire questions. Okay, I can questions. ask you three rapid fire questions. Okay, so first thing that comes to your mind um, favorite city in the United States besides the one that you live in? Boston. 
Good. Super. What was the first concert that you ever attended? Oh my gosh. Well, that's going back, but uh, I don't know. But but we host uh, uh, house concerts here, and I love musicians. I loved having Betty Sue there this summer, uh -huh. and uh, one of the teams that we hosted here one time have become good friends, and they won the Grammy for the best bluegrass album in 2017, I think. So, yeah, these are good who, people, were they? So. Who, were, who were they? Who were who were they? Who were they? Well, we it was probably the O'Connor you know, family band is how they won it, but Forrest O'Connor okay, gotcha. and, and Kate. Uh, uh, O'Connor are uh, um, uh, the two that we spend the most time with. So we'll try to get you some. We do a lot of bluegrass up here too. They would uh, be Jeff, a so fabulous we... act to bring to to uh, to the Avalon. Avalon at some point. Yeah. Last re last fire for our question. All right, last rapid fire. Would you rather speak every language in the world or be able to talk to animals? <laughs> I, I'd be. I, I'd like to speak every language, certainly. And I've got one more for you, being an Oklahoma boy. Uh, cake or pie? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good. Jeff, thanks for spending it. some time with us today. We really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. You and guys are, are delightful, and I sure appreciate you having me on. So. Thanks a lot. Look forward to seeing you next summer. Woo -hoo! Stay safe. See you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jeff. The Plan Air Easton podcast is brought to you by the Avalon Foundation, enriching the lives of those on the eastern shore of Maryland through the arts. Visit avalonfoundation.org for details on events, performances, and educational programming offered throughout the year. The Plan Air Easton podcast is produced by Nick Richards. Our theme music was generously provided by Blue Dot Sessions, with additional episode music by Poddington Bear. Remember to rate, comment, and subscribe. You can learn more about Plan Air Easton at planaireaston.com.